Well, once upon a time, a long time ago, in a far off land known as Philadelphia, I was in college. <laughs> so I went to a small Catholic university in Northwest Philly, founded by the Christian brothers called LaSalle University. Some of the ideals of the Christian brothers uh, that they ascribe to are the importance of education for all people, building up community, working towards social justice, and compassionate understanding across the barriers that would otherwise divide people. LaSalle's campus, when I attended, was a kind of green and brick oasis in an otherwise pretty rough neighborhood. You learned quickly, especially being from small town Connecticut, how to lay low and to stay out of trouble. So many experiences I didn't tell my parents about until after they were over, and I had lived to tell. <laughs> but lest you think that I was some kind of wild child during college, many of those things that I didn't tell my parents about until well after the fact were things that I was involved in through a center on campus called the Center for Community Learning. Much like the role of our church and society committee here, the CCL's role was to educate people about issues of social justice, both in the media area and in the world, and then to offer people opportunities for hands-on service to um, approach those issues of justice as well. Let's just say that the center for me was really the centerpiece on campus sharing those ideals of the Christian brothers. And it was my involvement there that led to my dashed dreams of becoming a famous sportscaster someday. Instead, I became a sociologist and went to seminary, although I'm not sure that the Christian brothers who taught on campus that, and advised my major saw that last part coming. <laughs> that whole women in ministry thing really wasn't uh, their bag. So. so one of the programs that I was involved in was called Homeless Outreach. Pretty self-explanatory when you think about it. There was an organization on Broad Street in Philadelphia called 802, where a small group of us would head on Wednesday nights. We would pick up a large jug of hot tea and some cups, a binder with our route laid out in it, and blanket tickets. We would park our big hind LaSalle University van somewhere along the route, and then we would head out on foot. And it was our job to approach any of the homeless folks that we saw on the street and to offer them a cup of tea and to share with them some conversation to learn a bit about their stories. We then would log the information and share it with the folks back at 802 who work to track people, who work to connect them with services like rehab programs and job programs and off the street shelter programs and provide blankets and showers and new clothes for them as well. Well, there was this one night on homeless outreach that I will never forget because it was the night that I got called out on my stuff. You see, there was a group of four of us young women out walking the route that night, and we came upon a gentleman who gladly sat with us for a cup of tea and shared his story. It was quite a lengthy visit as far as those visits went, and he seemed happy to have had a chance to spend time with us and hopeful about some of the services we mentioned if he would just go and make a visit to 802. As we were wrapping up, he thanked our group for the wonderful opportunity to share. And then he looked me straight in the eye and said, except for you, I don't thank you. You are the fakest person I think I have ever encountered in my life, he said. You'd better wipe that fake smile off your face and get really interested because we can tell, he said. Well, I was jarred, to say the least. <laughs> by that interaction, and after it made me angry and then sad, I realized that I needed to do some serious self-examination surrounding this. What was I out there for? Was it because a good friend of mine had asked me to come along for the ride and I wasn't gonna be the one who bailed, especially on those cold, rainy Philadelphia nights? Was it because I thought it would look good on a resume or an application someday? Was it because I thought I wanted to be able to have some unique stories to share from my college experience in Philadelphia. What was I thinking? That was the night that I had my first real well-remembered solo lesson about intention and integrity. Because you see, every reason that went through my head that night was about me. 
They had nothing to do the, with the people that I was out there to serve. They had nothing to do with building up a community and making people aware of those that were quite literally stepped on and spit on on a regular daily basis. They had nothing to do with hearing people's stories so that they might be genuinely offered services and a step up and built up in who they were. They had nothing to do with fighting for a time when people wouldn't have to live on the street, period. So what was I thinking? Well, I had to have a serious come to Jesus moment with myself in the days following that interaction. I had to talk to some trusted advisors about what this was all about. And I think I came out on the other side in a better place. I landed here, so I suppose something changed. But when I look back on that night and that experience from a spot some 15 years in the future now, I am grateful, mixed with a twinge of sadness still. But I am grateful for that, the tough stuff that I learned about myself and the lesson that I learned about what service is really about and what integrity and intention are all about. And I am thankful for the voice of God through I heard, that I heard through the voice of that man who lived in a doorway on Walnut Street in downtown Philadelphia. Have you ever had someone call you out on your stuff before? <laughs> Challenge you and who it is that you are or who it is that you say you are based on what you have said or done? Well, when I read the scripture passages for this morning, that homeless outreach story came flooding back into my mind. Psalm 139, you see, is one of my favorites in the entire Bible. Where can I go where God is not present? What can I do or say or think that God does not already know? Do I really want God to search me and know me, though? Because if God does, will God find more of those selfish moments, like on that street in Philadelphia? Or will God find more faithful or community-minded ones? It's in the times reading over this psalm and thinking back on some of my intentions that I am super glad that our God is merciful and forgiving. And if we think about the possible author of this psalm, King David, then we can imagine that he felt the same way. I oftentimes wonder if David really, really wanted God to know what it was that he was thinking, that he really, whether or not he really wanted God to search him and know him and know if there was any hurtful way about him. Because this is the same King David whose oftentimes shining moment that we remember is his stealing of Uriah's wife, getting her pregnant, and then sending Uriah out on the front lines to be killed, friends. <laughs> Talk about interesting intentions. And yet, God used real people to help David see the places where he had fallen short, to help redirect his ways, and God used David to change the world of his time for the people of Israel. He was the forebear of Jesus Christ. So God saw something in David that could be used despite the oftentimes rocky starts and intentions in his life. My friends, part of the Christian life is opening up to God, sharing our stuff with God, and allowing God to come in and redirect and refocus when necessary. But one of the other parts of the Christian life is about living for the building up of the community, for the betterment of the lives of those around us, for the greater good. That was what Paul was trying to help that early church in Philippi learn when he spoke to them about unity and love, that despite the opposition from the outside and despite the competition about who was more faithful than who else, the life of faith following Jesus was a life worth living. There was some benefit, especially if they could live it together and share their faith with the world. In the paraphrase of the Bible that's called the message, Paul's words in the beginning of the second chapter to the Philippians are these. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with one another. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. 
Put yourself aside and help others get ahead instead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Boy, do I wish I had those words ringing through my ears all those years ago on that street. Then again, I suppose I hope I would have those words ringing through my ears <laughs> every day of my life when I encounter this world and all of the things that this world really says. Because this world tells us that the only way to be is to be first. The only way to get ahead is to step on other people to get there. The only way to function is to focus on me, myself, and I. Paul's words are so countercultural that they almost seem crazy. But that's what the life of faith is sometimes, downright craziness. For instance, some may consider it downright craziness that we have been inviting people into listening sessions around here with our planning task force to tell us the things that they see as blessing around here and then to tell us the things that they see as reasons for concern, to share in real time with each other about these things and to see this place from each other's perspectives, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back or have a grape session with one another, but rather so that we can come together and come up with a long range plan for our community that has the greater good for all of us and for the world in mind. It's downright craziness that 42 of our folks at four o'clock in the morning next Sunday, 33 of whom are high school and college age young adults are giving up a week of their summer vacation to head out with servant hearts to South Dakota to live together in community and to serve in whatever way we can to work our behinds off in God's name. Because if anyone seems to think that this is going to be a vacation, I promise you that we will come back exhausted and you will know that it is not. Because God calls us to get outside ourselves for long enough to lend a helping hand. Our faith, my friends, is kind of crazy. And that's what's so awesome about it, really because we never know what God is going to do next. We have the opportunity to hit the nail on the head the first time with our words and actions. And if we do, matching our intentions with our words and our deeds in a way that builds up instead of breaks down, then rock on. But if we don't, we have a God who offers us second and third and 20th chances to repent and rebuild and do it with greater faithfulness and integrity the next time.